Hi, Stacy. How are you? Okay. Nice to see you. You too. Thanks. Yeah, I'm working, but I can multitask. Listen in. Hi, Craig. Hi. How are you both? Good. Greetings. Hi, Jerry. Jerry. Hi, Craig. <laughs> hey, Eric. Hey, mm. Stacy. <laughs> How's everybody this bright and cloudy day? Okay. Oh, it's sunny here. Really? Yeah. Uh, Beautiful here. <laughs> it's Craig, dark it's, outside. It's evening where you are, right? <laughs> yeah, 11. What, what, 11 p.m.? Oh, I didn't realize that. Wow. We yeah, are your late. 14 hours ahead of uh, Pacific. We are your late night show. <laughs> the late, late show. <clears throat> Ooh, um, Eric, what city are you in? I forget. Um, it's uh, like an hour west of Philadelphia. So I'm in Pennsylvania. King of Prussia or? It's around there. Yeah, actually. <laughs> it's close there. Cool. Uh, I don't know why, but every time I think of Western uh, Pennsylvania or Central Pennsylvania, I think of Bump and Hollow. And what was the name of the painter who did Bump and Hollow? He was painting the Pennsylvania hillsides. I can tell you in a sec. Famous American painter. And I can, I'm, I'm in, in my head, I'm Thomas Hart Benton. Okay. Thomas Hart Benton. He's not in your head. <laughs> yeah, he's in my outside head too. In your external brain. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I, and, and in fact, I'd added, there's an article titled, and I learned about Bump and Hollow in undergrad in my art history course, but there's a, a New Yorker article titled The Bump and Hollow of Thomas Hart Benton, which I will put in the chat and hopefully is still a live link. <laughs> see. Well, I know when you drive west in Pennsylvania, you go through mountains, like you're tunneling, you see these hills all above and you see the windmills on top. And <laughs> yep, yep. I haven't been through that area. I went, I went to Penn, so I was in Philly for oh, cool. a couple of years. Um, it's very interesting. I, I um, So I, I lived in two cities that were very similar to each other, pretty close to each other. I lived in Philly and St. Louis. Uh, so Philadelphia is on uh, the Schuylkill River uh, mm -hmm. and, and the, I guess the Delaware. Um, yeah. And uh, the, on the Eastern shore of Philadelphia, there is a city that is quite dangerous, which is Camden, New Jersey. Um, on the East, so St. Louis is on the Mississippi River. And then on the Eastern side is East St. Louis, which is very dangerous. Um, both cities have a main line that kind of, uh, in St. Louis, it runs straight west into Ledoux and fake French named, uh, actually, they may not be fake French named, but I think they were because the French owned, had the middle of the country. Um, but the, the sort of the ritzy suburbs went west and in Philadelphia, they were definitely fake, fake named, uh, you know, like Bryn Mawr and, and so forth, heading up northwest through the main line. But then more interesting, both cities had a height restriction. Hmm. So, so in Philadelphia, there was the gentleman's agreement that for many, many years, nobody could build a building taller than the hat on the statue of Billy Penn that was on <laughs> City Hall at Market and 14th. Nice. Um, and uh, what was his name? Uh, the guy who violated it was the brother, uh, Rouse, Charles Rouse or something like that, Will Rouse. Will Rouse finally built the building that broke the gentleman's agreement. And since it wasn't a law, nobody could like, like go punish him. And since then the city, the skyline of Philadelphia looks like other cities sort of skylines, kind of boring. Uh, but they had a limit. And then in St. Louis, there was, sure, a was that the same Rouse as Columbia, Missouri Rouse? Uh, yes. No, uh, Will Rouse uh, is his brother. Okay. Uh, pretty sure. Going to kind of fact check it in a second. But, um, but then in St. Louis, there was a height, uh, there was a height, I think, restriction where like in the Washington, D.C., you can't build higher than the Capitol. And in mm -hmm. St. Louis, you couldn't build higher than the arch. And it graduated mm -hmm. out from the arch. And I used to live within eyesight of the arch. I could see the arch from my mm. terrace, basically. And it would change, like in weather, it would be beautiful. And then if, if a police car was sitting underneath, it would shine and glow and red. And it was really beautiful. But, but the cities were remarkably sort of similar in that way. They were also pretty um, racially segregated. There were sort of neighborhoods that were really quite divisive. It was, they weren't in, neither of them was a very well integrated city. Uh, super interesting. Uh, for everybody who's just arrived, I'm comparing Philadelphia and St. Louis. Um, yeah, well, one thing they did in Philadelphia, that there's thousands of murals that are painted. So the artists, they got artists to paint all kinds of scenes on buildings. It's pretty cool. Um, one of my favorite a, things I, I'm sorry. 
Go ahead. Yeah, one of my favorite perspectives on building height in cities is from Jim Keene, who was my boss when I was at Palo Alto. He was the city manager and had previously been city manager of Berkeley and kind of a Renaissance guy. And he said, in his mind, that the, the maximum height of a building in a city should be that if you're on the top floor and you stick your head out the window, you can have a conversation with somebody on the street without shouting. And that puts you to about three to four stories. Yeah. Yeah, not much taller than that. And if you and if you walk through cities, you know that that's about the size. It feels good. Maybe five if you push it. You know, think think Paris. But in the movie Rocky, he was shouting to his neighbor. Hey. <laughs> so it goes. So many interesting stories about about urban design and all these kinds of things. Michael, did you want to jump in? I was just going to say that uh, the Soho area in in New York has. Uh, I think it's a six um, or had a, uh, a six floor limit, um, which was varied to eight. And then people began buying the airspace from the six story buildings that weren't using their seventh and eighth floors that were now permissible. And so now there are taller things going up around it, but it's still pretty low. It's still surprisingly low. For New York. Um. Love that. Um, and then there's, there's interesting stories about uh, uh, the building of freeways, you know, the, 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 the interstate highway system coming in. There's the freeway rebellion. Uh, Portland is one of the cities that uh, didn't go along so well. And one of the interesting things about Portland's history is that at some point they used some of the money that was <coughs> destined for freeways to fund uh, the building of streetcars again, uh, because wow. then there's the Great American Streetcar Conspiracy, which is one of my favorite sour notes in American history. American history. Um, and I'm hearing uh, feedback I'm from my voice. From my from voice. There we go, Gil, it was you. Um, uh, so has any, uh, raise your hand if you've seen the movie Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Even way back when? Um, it's based on facts. It's actually based on facts. Uh, so Firestone, General Motors, Phillips 66 and Mack truck wanted to sell bus fleets to cities. And by 1910 or 20, all major American cities had light rail, inexpensive light rail for a nickel. You could basically ride from out of town into town reading your newspaper. There were, light rail systems were really, really good all across the US. So these four companies collude. They were found later to have violated antitrust and were penalized. But by that time, by that time, as you'll see, the rails were torn up. Um, so they, they colluded and they created a, a company called National City Lines. They put a puppet in charge of it and National City Lines proceeded to buy city light rail systems. Then it proceeded to slowly turn down service. Like, you know, we're gonna go every 20 minutes, not every 15 minutes or every 10 minutes. And then they would say, well, that last stop isn't being served. And they, but pretty quickly, they started cutting back service and they said, this is uneconomical. And they shut down the lines and they burned the rail cars. Um, and once you've burned the rail cars, like these are perfectly functional cars. Uh, and if you go to um, San Francisco, they have antique rail cars from all across the country. And we used to live on the on the end Judah. Uh, and that's the, the depot for the antique cars was at the end of the end Judah line. So at the end of the day, all of we would, we would see all the old cars come past uh, on their way, you know, on their way for rest in the evening. Um, but, but then we sort of tore up all these really excellent light rail systems. And now it's like putting in a subway system with the boring company, what? So it, it just amazing how uh, capitalism bends history to its, uh, to its needs when it, uh, when it wants to. Where in middle Pennsylvania, uh, Merrick? I joined a little late. Oh yeah, I live in Downingtown. It's about an hour west of Philly. Okay, um, I'm familiar with Altoona and um, the uh, Mennonite and uh, oh, yeah. areas, kind of the farming areas. Um, yeah, out west of Lancaster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful part of the country. Um, let's do a, a round of check-ins. Uh, Eric, do you, uh, do you want to check in? And let's go, um, yeah, Eric, um, Eric Craig Stacy. Yeah, um, I'm multitasking, but um, I'm going to listen in. Um, so, um, yeah, two weeks ago, I was able. I met Ted Nelson. He was at uh, the Vintage Computer Federation uh, exhibit. So, 
um, yeah, I did an exhibit about Ted and he saw it and he loved it. <laughs> so, and I had some time to talk with him. So on an earlier call, we were uh, brainstorming, well, could we take some of Ted's ideas forward today? And um, yeah, so yeah, I, I actually, I asked him that question and I had a list of uh, his ideas and to think about, uh, yeah, can he prioritize them? And his answer is no, I, I can't prioritize them. I don't know what to do anymore. <laughs> um, he, it's like he needs it all or nothing. Um, yeah, I mean, the web developed a certain way. It became what it is because of many different factors. And he tried, he had some business issues and just getting volunteers to do programming was tricky. Um, so, I mean, it's up to us if we want to do anything with his ideas, you know, like thinking about the new, the new Jerry's brain, that's possible. We could incorporate some zigzag and some other stuff, uh, tumblers, if we wanted to go down that architecture and build it ourselves, but I'm sure there's other products out there. So thanks. I'm just going to listen for most of the time. Um, Eric, that's fascinating. And uh, I think I've met Ted Nelson once or twice and listened to him talk and things like that. He's definitely a man on a mission. <clears throat> His mission definitely didn't overlap well with the architecture of the inner tubes. Um, and I have a brief but amusing story because uh, back in the day when I first became a tech industry trends analyst, uh, here's Ted Nelson in my brain. Mm -hmm. I visited Project Xanadu, yep. <clears throat> which was the company that was going, and it was founded in 1960, Jeepers. Yeah, I know. Um, and so I probably visited them in 80, 88, 87, somewhere in there, I think. Um, and I met Roger Gregory, who to this day yep. is the geekiest geek I've ever met. <clears throat> um, and I wrote an article about them that I don't have linked here because it way predates my use of the brain. Uh, and in the article, I said Project Xanadu will, should have an offer in the market in two years. And they didn't. And then um, imagine my surprise. Was it here? One of these articles. Um, <clears throat> uh, imagine my surprise to find an article recently where Project Xanadu is still alive and two years from shipping. Um, uh, so I think it might, uh, I'll, I will post this link so that we can see whether it's this article. But um, sort of, I've, um, I've seen way too many. Um, Allison, do you mind muting? Um, <clears throat> and I've seen way too many um, sort of really big ideas kind of come and go and not make it. And then a few ideas, a few really big ideas, like Google is a big idea, just caught on and, and I mean, well, the well. Yeah. So um, if people are interested in like exploring his ideas, just uh, send me, contact me somehow, either in the tools and technology on Mattermost. I've been putting a few links in there. So... Oh. Okay. Thanks, Eric. Thanks very sure. much. That was a, a fun, fun story. Anybody else with stories or thoughts about Ted Nelson? And um, actually, Gil is asking New Jersey's brain. Um, Gil, I, I think the reference here is that one of the, one of the goals of OGM broadly is to get me out of the brain and into some new tool, <clears throat> and probably not one one new tool to rule them all, uh, but rather. Uh, a polyglot tool, a tool that, that can morph inside of uh, space so that it acts like the brain sometimes and it acts like Kumu sometimes and it acts like a database lookup sometimes and, and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we don't, we clearly don't have it yet, but uh, we're, we've, we're been, we've been working for figuring out how that works. The car in my, um... Allison, 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 could you mute? Oh, your, your oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Excellent, thanks. Yeah, so I didn't know that was the purpose of OGM, but it's cool for me, uh, except that if we're doing that, then we're not getting you out of the brain, we're getting all of us out of That's something correct. into something. That's correct. And and the goal was to get me into a shared collaborative yeah, yeah. Uh, thinking environment. That was the goal. Uh, and it so happens that I'm addicted to the brain, other people are addicted to other tools. Um, and I wanted to meet in the middle. Like what, and, and even what does that middle look like is a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Michael's here with an actual platform called Factor, uh, and he's sort of uh, been here uh, participating in a variety of different calls and, and, and so forth, trying to figure out what role does a company like Factor play in this ecosystem, including how does Factor make a living while helping everyone else build sort of information commons, idea commons, knowledge mm -hmm. art, whatever we want to call it. <clears throat> I mean, Michael, if you want to... If you want to jump well, in and riff on that for a second. Go I would just say, you know, on, on a theoretical level, um, the 
you know, the avoidance of the one platform to rule them all notion has a lot to do with interoperability and the idea that if people had, you know, their, their knowledge, um, Jerry's in the brain, portable to another platform when they wanted to view it in a different way, like, you know, I want to I want to look at this graphically, and you know I want to see images for everything, and that that one platform is really good for that, and I want to see the same stuff as a sequential selection of links, and another platform is good for that, um, but but certainly without the ambition to do everything the brain does. Factor is an example of. You know, we want to take granular information and give the user control of how to um, how to relate it and and who to share it with, um, whether to make it completely private, you know, single single player mode, or uh, or to do things as a group or in public. Thanks, Michael. I was I was in uh, <clears throat> I attended a mapathon, a virtual mapathon that happened over last weekend, a Friday a Friday at three p.m. Pacific until Saturday at three p.m. Pacific and just attended a few sessions in there. And one session I sort of fell into because I couldn't find the session I was looking for, um, had a fellow who was sharing uh, a bunch of models, uh, sort of information models. And he was using who, what, when, why, where as the framework. And for each one of them, he had put up pretty interesting sort of Venn diagrams and, and other kinds of aspects. And then earlier in the day in a different session, um, some people with projects had come through and they had put post-its for their projects for where they belonged on his conceptual diagrams. And I was sitting thinking, wouldn't it be cool if our data was sort of marked up and if we had meta, rich metadata that, that gave us extra kind of dimensionality or richness to the information. And then like, like a view master, when you click, it kind of rotates the next image. If you could then sort of pick, pick how you want to see your data. And right now I want to see it like Hans Rosling sees data with bubbles mov moving over time, but click. Now I want to see actually um, who is, which of these projects is spiritual, which of these projects is, is uh, entrepreneurial and which of these projects is public service or something like that. And, and with, with like the projects scattered in that space or something. And if we had rich data collection and separate data from, uh, from the tools, then you, you can start to flip to the tool that works for what you're trying to say at the moment. And I don't know if anybody's doing that. I know that there's some really powerful tools like Tom Sawyer and R and a couple others, many of which are open source, but there's but R is specifically a statistical package. <clears throat> so what you can do in R is statistical and out rich, beautiful, varied statistical analysis, as long as that's what it is. Uh, I don't know that it's any good at conceptual diagrams and other kinds of things, but I'm wondering like who's doing this and could, could these tools start to play together because we're getting better and better data out there with lots of metadata. Anybody seen this, done this, thought about this? Wanted this. Who? I've wanted this. Oh, excellent. Me too. Yeah. After my after my Living Between Worlds webinar yesterday, somebody commented that, that that one of the things they like about what I do is that it feels like I'm 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 holding a beautiful stone in my hand and I'm constantly kind of turning it and looking at it from different sides and angles and talking about that and just kind of an ongoing rotational encounter with the complexity of it all. And that's what this bunch of folks here does. And it's like the philosopher's that kind of stone for chance. Want tools that let us do that to continue to query in different ways from different perspectives with different outcomes, with different correlations. Absolutely. Um, and it's not easy to envision that, much less do it. Um, and that's the interesting thing. Do you want to do you want to just give us an example or riff on that a little bit? Because I feel the same way. Um, uh, to, to riff on the tools, no, I want to riff on what uh, Chauncey Bellis taught me about diagnosis. So, so um, I forget who, who first said this, but uh, prescription without diagnosis in medicine would be considered malpractice. And yet we all do that a lot in the world. You know, here's the answer to what's the undefined problem. And so his approach to that is, 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 to, is a three-level interrogation. One is what's going on, what's actually the state of things now, and that will incorporate some of our frustration and dissatisfaction, but describing what's so now, how did we get here? And then what is keeping things stuck? And that's been his approach to you know, large enterprises, uh, logistical problems, uh, operational issues, design. Um, I don't know if we've done that. It's, it's clearly here anecdotally in the background all the time. 
uh, but I wonder if we have an explicit diagnosis of what we think is lacking, broken, missing, not serving us um, that drives our design initiatives toward whatever it is we're trying to do. Or are we just going to be more organic about it the way that we, you know? <clears throat> um, my own take on that is that when I see, when you say explicit, there's two different ways I think of it, and there's probably six different ways everybody else thinks about it. One way is that there's a formalism that becomes the structure with which from which you build uh, out the plan. And the other one is that there is a detailed plan for what you're building, that there's a, a spec, a design spec. Um, and I, I had this conversation a couple of days ago, <clears throat> which is I, I've seen a lot of tools that begin with some kind of abstract framework, and that limits what the tool can do. Mm -hmm. It limits what people can do with the tools, maybe the better thing I can say. Um, and so I'm really interested in sort of emerging into a tool that does lots of different things. And the, what the reason I love the brain is that I only use the bare minimum features in it. And those give me an expressive capacity that I find really powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I then use it for a variety of different things that somebody using a formal structure would be like, hey, that's wrong. You're, mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're not allowed to do that. Or we, we said this was only going to be an entity relationship model. So you must, so every node must be a noun. And, and must have a verb relationship with another noun or something like that. It's like, I ain't doing that. Um, and, and in not doing that in, in off-roading, it's actually far more powerful and expressive for me. So, so I'm not sure that the abstract, I think the abstract frameworks often limit what we can do. They can add it layered in later. They can add power to what we do. So what I loved about the models I saw on Saturday in that Zoom session was that wow, I would love to see data separated in, in that Venn diagram way or whatever else it was. Um, and, I don't, and I don't know how to do that today. I'd, I'd just love to see that, but I don't want to start from there. Mm -hmm. And then the other way is like, let's build out, a, let's build out in the traditional software world, a, a big spec. I can give you use cases for what I'm doing and my use cases will wind up being different from a bunch of other people's use cases. So I'm not sure how to get to a really good complete spec. So anyone else who thinks thinks uh, has a better plan, please, uh, please jump in. Well, my plan is to basically do research into the nature of semiotics and basically how a sign as an irreducible triad um, of a sign vehicle, something that is existing and physically in the world is interpreted to point to an object, not a thing, but when the 16th century um, Thomas epistemology, what is the primordial reality of a relation? So, so it's very, you know, woo-woo, scientific, recovering the semiosis of the Latins from the 16th century. Um, but basically starting from the bottom and working up and doing the science and thinking, um, and, uh, it won't be done in my lifetime and I'm fine with that. Um, but that's what I try to do. Um, you, go ahead. Just a scratch on one piece of what you said, when you said Thomas, I think you meant Thomism as in St. Thomas Aquinas and some exactly. of his logics. Can you yes. just give us a taste of that? Mm. Pope, what does it mean? What does it mean to think that way? Pope Ratzinger, Pope um, or or, or uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, Cardinal became, Ratzinger, who became you know a pope, um, basically said that the era of substance is over. Um, we need we know we now know that relation is as primordial as substance, and we are now entering into the era of relation. So you know, there's, 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 a, there's a hint, there's a pointer there. But basically, um, the essence of how we know things is relation. It's, it's, it's not a thing. Um, and the study of how relations make meaning is currently semiotics. And biosemiotics is just absolutely fascinating right now. It's driving both work in biology and semiotics. 
and it's obscure. I will, I will admit, um, I will uh, uh, put a uh, absolutely fantastic um, Nora Bateson uh, biosemiotics um, 2021 gathering um, in the chat. And uh, I, I highly suggest um, listening to a number of the other um, talks in that conference. I, you know, I, it's not for me here to basically go deep into that, but basically it takes the shift in mental position that rather than energy and matter being what life is, life is communication. Communication and meaning start with life. Life starts with meaning and communication. Um, and it's a big shift and it's an unfamiliar shift to, you know, most scientists, but, you know, basically experience is real, communication is real, and they're scientifically um, amenable to understanding. Um, Mark, thank you. Um, that's really helpful. Um, and interesting that you went to energy and matter because I was about to jump in and say, gosh, this is a little bit like physics where matter is actually energy trapped in fields. And the problem is we pay attention to fields. Uh, we, we pay attention to the matter more than we pay attention to the fields. That's sort of historically our problem. And then uh, David Bohm, the philosopher, invented a, uh, an experimental language called Rio mode, which was a verb centric language because his oh. critique of sort of uh, Western languages was that we were noun centered and, and, and th that if you shifted to a verb centered language that changed how you saw things. And then I can kind of hop and skip to other places. And in 2010, I started something called the relationship economy expedition <clears throat> because my thesis was that what matters are the relationships, the bindings, the thing uh, kind of, I think very parallel to what you just said, Mark. And, and I have another video that I'll find and put here, which is why I do what I do. And I, I, I shot this a long time ago. Um, and uh, it has a little, it, I, I, can, I can do this in a minute. I, I, I would love to put, I've never, I don't think I've ever uh, just described this uh, in a no GM call. So I'd love to describe it. Um, a long time ago, I read or heard that Leibniz was probably the last polymath, the last person alive who might've known all the disciplines mm -hmm. of his day. And because we write women out of history, who knows, there were very likely some polymath women we haven't heard about. And there's other polymaths you may prefer like Bacon and others, <clears throat> pick your favorite polymath. But I, but I, pictured, I pictured Leibniz kind of standing in a field and all the disciplines start to scatter. And th the disciplines haven't grown so far that he can't actually go out to the edge of uh, literature and poetry, mathematics, <clears throat> what, what becomes medicine, alchemy, all of that. And, and learn it all. And he helped co-invent the calculus. He was a great mathematician. And, and uh, he and Isaac Newton basically uh, invented the calculus around the same time, called it different things. Anyway, then, then this ring kind of explodes and no human can learn everything that happens in every discipline. And then the disciplines form up and they form walls and barriers between them. And the mathematicians uh, hate the, the hum humanities people and the lake has alligators and, you know, and the, the counselors hate the waiters and the lake has alligators. For anybody, any of you who know Camp Granada, but but um, this becomes very competitive. And the way you make um, <clears throat> your mark in a discipline, you kind of have to pick a discipline and join a discipline. And the way you make your mark is you pick a, a fractal edge <clears throat> of the leading edge of that discipline and try to say something that bends the course of your discipline somehow. And then that's what we do for a long time until people start doing the transdisciplinary thing. And anyway, at one day I realized, what if Leibniz is actually standing on a sphere? instead of in a plane or a pizza where these things are separating and they're always gonna to get too big to, to understand, what if he's standing on a sphere? And what made me think that was, I'm an amateur, I'm a dilettante, I, I sniff at lots of flowers. And I was noticing that the language in cognitive science and neural networks was really damn similar to linguistics and semiotics, was really damn similar to uh, other kinds of places. And it seemed like if you went and talked to the leading edge thinkers in lots of disciplines, they were getting closer together. They might never agree to do anything, but it seemed like they were getting closer together, right? And so, so that was actually heartening because the idea that knowledge is just exploding and we'll, we'll never be able to wrap our heads around it is a bit, is a bit too big. But, but if knowledge is more holographic and more echoey and more resonant and, and kind of like the, there's lots of things that, that we have in common, that's super interesting, right? And that begged the question, and I'll finish this, this little analogy story, that begged the question, what, what sits at the other end over here? Like, well, okay, if, if things are converging then to what? And here I borrow, um, here I just had a kind of a metaphorical explanation. I borrowed yin and yang from Taoism. And I said, uh, yin and yang 
at their most fundamental uh, are meant to be held in creative balance. And it's not that all men are yang and all women are yin, it's that there are these sort of feminine, masculine, bright, dark, um, active, passive, uh, outward, inward kinds of energies that are complementary. And that a healthy entity, whether it's a person or a family or a culture or a, a civilization, needs to have that yin and yang and creative tension. And my own amateur thesis was that we have been suffering from a yang overdose for somewhere between 300 and 3000 years. So 300 years is the industrial revolution, 3000 years is written language per Leonard Schlein's book, The Alphabet Versus the Goddess. Whether, when and how and whether that happened is a really fun conversation over a couple bottles of wine and a really good meal. But I miss Leonard so much. Leonard was awesome. Oh, yeah. I, lo I loved Leonard. <clears throat> um, I got to meet him uh, briefly. He gave a presentation in Marin at the theater. <clears throat> and uh, his daughter is Tiffany Schlein, uh, who is out and about doing cool things about Shabbat technology. Shabbat is, is one of her uh, riffs right now. Um, so then so then what was heartening to me also about this latter piece of my little model here uh, is that I believe that we're in an era right now of rebalancing of yin and yang. Because in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, you could barely talk about yin. Yin was effectively demonized. Yang won and pursued a scorched earth strategy about yin. Stamp out this native indigenous wisdom. Stamp out women. Like, like the, the persecution of women in the Middle Ages uh, and, and branding of them as witches. These were, these were the holders of traditional knowledge in Europe who got killed for, for being the bearers of wisdom. Like really shitty. Like, the, like human history is full of, full of crap like this. But, but I think we're in an era right now where we're, we're moving towards some kind of reconciliation, balancing awareness uh, between these forces. And that part of this big puzzle we're all trying to chew on deeply fascinates me, right? Like really fascinates me. And I'm hopeful that, what, that some part of the human population can figure that, that back out and can start living in a way that other people are like, oh, I'll have what they're having, right? Because I think that's, that's a, a good model for change. Because right now, the vast majority of humans on earth, I think, see that their kids are going to have a shittier time than they did and that their grandparents did. And that is causing all sorts of commotion and ruckus all across the earth. It's really a bad thing. Um, so, <clears throat> so that's kind of why I wake up in the morning is that I'm trying to figure out what does this puzzle look like? Who's got the right pieces of the puzzle? How do the pieces fit? How do we think about this? What's a way to approach life? so that you can be part of, of, of fixing the rebalancing and unifying how we think. And so the big fungus that I'm talking about shared cultivation of here is that. It, it, and so your work on semiotics, Mark, I'm hoping will meet these different kinds of ideas in the way that I curate them. And then as Stacy puts things together or points to other people's work that she likes, that fits into the puzzle and, and lather, rinse, repeat. And we might actually have a, a useful learning system, environment, something like that. And I'll hit pause so anybody who wants to can jump in. Sure, I, I agree. What I would um, point out, um, again, another esoteric kind of notion, is Bertrand's Russell, Bertrand Russell's uh, book about Leibniz and his critique of Leibniz's logic, such that a property for anything, say a lemon, as you know, a certain type of property. It's yellow, it's round, it's it's squishy, it can be squished. These properties are finite, but the relation, say, of Jerry to lemon is infinite, uncountable, unknowable. Um, and this, I think, is a tragedy when we get to things like RDF or certain kinds of mm, rational slash logical notions about knowledge and knowing that basically say a lemon is a fruit well hooray that, that, that's great but you know there are uncountable lemons from the dawn of lemoning whenever lemons emerged from uh darwinian evolution to lemons in the future there's infinite lemons and there's infinite lemonings and there's infinite abundance to the way that we relate to lemons and lemons relate to the rest of the non-us. And so that, in addition to the paradox that all knowledge is social, but then again, all knowledge is personal, um, are you know, kind of the 
the again weird keys that gosh i would love to and had great conversations with um people uh yesterday and i continue to try to have conversations with uh anybody here about all this weird stuff because it really takes two or more to try and work this out it's not me sitting in my little alcove trying to figure this out that's going to make it happen thanks mark thanks anybody else want to jump in on this there's also a different slightly different conversation happening in the chat which i'm happily happy to switch to if someone wants to jump in with that um and we were going to go i think eric craig stacy um so let's go back to the chickens uh craig stacy uh and then wendy You hey. Uh, I've been geeking out for a couple of weeks. Excellent. I've been geeking out for a couple of weeks. I uh, so I've been developing and hosting websites on Windows web servers for over twenty years, and in last years, especially this year, my account has become extraordinarily expensive. I've been paying over two hundred and fifty dollars a month. A month a month for a windows i mean a very powerful hefty web, windows web server with uh backup and uh email 250 boxes per domain and absolutely huge bigger than i need now we scaled it up way back when i had uh hotel software that was uh that was running <clears throat> very busily so 250 bucks a month for what i'm doing now which is largely altruistic type projects it just became nuts you know so i started to look at uh, node.js and linux two weeks ago i didn't know anything about either of them so i've uh, spent the last couple of weeks converting the back end of one of my sites to uh, uh, node.js code and just this morning, I bought into uh, a Linux uh, hosting setup, a company called DigitalOcean. They sell droplets. They define a web server as a droplet. And I've got one four times bigger uh, in specification wise, four times bigger than the Windows web server that I'm going to be departing from for a tenth of the price. $24 a month. I'm absolutely gobsmacked. And today, without, I'm well impressed actually with my, with my own performance because from knowing absolutely nothing about Linux a couple of days ago, just having re read, 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 read. And of course, I've been doing this kind of thing for 30 years. So I fired up a Linux box and then I had a good laugh. So I'm looking at this, uh, figuring out how to do it. Now you can have several Node.js websites in one droplet, but to do that, you have to install a server. And I'm looking at the name of the server. This will give you a giggle, Jerry, because I'm sure you're familiar. I'm looking at the name of this web server, N-G-I-N-X, and I'm trying to say Minx. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are words in Thai which begin with NG. It's quite an Asian thing. Mm is a name. Greg, right? and yeah. we call it, we call it Nginx. Exactly. So I was talking with a friend of mine this morning to get a little bit of help. And he said, Craig, I think it's called Nginx. <laughs> and I just, I had to giggle with, you know how you can, uh, you, you laugh at your own embarrassment. Of course it's Nginx and I'm trying to say Nginx. However, I fired that up and I've now got the website running and I've got a free uh, um, security certificate for it and I'm well on the way. All I need now is to get a, uh, uh, to get node mail, node mailer um, running properly and install mm -hmm. a webmail uh, client on the, uh, the server. And I can ditch that window system and save over 200 bucks a month. Yay. <laughs> so I'm well happy about that. So I'm, I'm jumping ship. Microsoft can stick it where the sun don't shine <laughs> from now on. So I'm very happy about that. 
Otherwise, I've been having some really excellent conversations with the community which is developing around the uh, Center for Humane Technologies uh, Fundamentals of Humane Technology course. The course is now launched and there are dozens of people now taking the course and there are two or three meetings every week that we can uh, we can join and, and uh, talk about what's going on. Absolutely super conversations about how social media is affecting people's lives and minds and moods and wants and desires and, and hatreds and you know, if Facebook or whatever you whatever your jam is, if uh, if uh, Facebook, Facebook is, is the last thing you see at night, and the first thing you see when you wake up in the morning, and it's what you're doing all day long when you should be doing something else, walking the dog, playing with your kids, planting trees, you're doing Facebook. I'm thinking that so much human behavior focused in that way is bound to, and this is billions of people. It's not just an individual. It's so important because it's billions of people behaving like this, that that human behavior is actually changing it, or it must have some effect. I fear quite a significant effect on human nature. Mm -hmm. Repetitive behavior again and again and again and again and again and every day for years, billions of people, it's got to be changing human nature. So the wonderful thing about this whole concept of humane technology and its desire to reimagine and rebuild, remake, completely relaunch if possible, social media experience is an exciting opportunity uh, since I'm involved, I, I, I do like that, uh, that field of endeavor and I'm a coder, I build websites and I really want, really, really want to be involved in it all. It's such a great opportunity to uh, attempt and learn how and attempt to uh, uh, create social media, offering social media activities, a new reimagined social media, which can steer or can push human nature back in back towards where it was before social media did all its damage so that's also exciting so uh yeah i'm uh, i'm busy and enthusiastic Feeling sounds good. like it craig yeah it sounds like it yeah. i, I want to push things back to like where before we became consumers um, right, yeah, because that yeah. ate our brains as well. And I think other people probably have other missions with mm -hmm. other words or, or things that happened to us. But for me, the mm -hmm. consumerization of our lives was extremely damaging and tore the social fabric because if there's no such thing as society, as Maggie Thatcher told us, then all we need to do is buy more shit that we don't really need because otherwise the economy <laughs> stops and everything you know grinds to a halt. Mm -hmm. That is not a civilization. Yeah, you know, almost entirely right. Civilization. Sorry, Gil, go ahead. Sorry, if you don't buy more shit, the terrorists will have won. Exactly. Some president. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, consumerism um, affected me very strongly as a as a teenager. But everybody's caring about uh, you know the color of the neighbor's curtains and how new the the car is and how nice the garden looks and and okay, all these things are nice, but they didn't seem important to me. The world was, uh, the planet was burning 50 years ago when I was a teenager, <clears throat> to, to using that, that, that term metaphorically. Yeah. Um, Le Le Leopold Kaur wrote a wonderful piece in Resurgence Magazine, I think in the early 1950s, about remedial consumption. Uh, and he basically asserted that the whole consumption machine is designed to make and fill holes in people. You know, you feel empty, you buy shit. And that's the dynamic of the whole thing. Goes back to Bernays and others. Um, Jerry, Jerry, you, I, I, don't know if, I don't know if you or I or somebody wrote a piece a few years ago um, likening consumerism and consumption to tuberculosis. Yeah. Called consumption, which was a disease that would eat you out from the inside. And here in our world, we prize consumption as the highest good. Very strange. Mm. 
I think I just saw it go by here. Cons here's consumption meant tuberculosis in the 19th century, <clears throat> basically. Yeah. Um, I'm quite sure I wrote something about it and I can't find it anywhere. <laughs> if you do, please post it back. I will. Um, More money. Cool, thank you. And uh, I've got the, uh, a longer queue here than normal, but Stacy, Wendy, Hank, and then Shimon and Allison, who are having a great conversation in the chat, will bring you into the in the conversation. So, Stacy. Wow, what an interesting conversation. <laughs> um, so, I just wanted to say I watched a great um, documentary yesterday. It was um, what was it? Where's the outrage? Corporate uh, welfare, and it was followed by um, a pat like you know two people answering questions and a moderator. And I just wanna say two things about it. So there were three case studies. The second case study, which started in the middle was all about the farm bill. Mm. And which I wanted to bring here. I was hoping class was gonna be here because it was really easy to understand and just the kind of you know media that I'm always looking to be able to share. But what I found interesting, and it wasn't until I sat down because before that I was multitasking, but they had a way that you could create clips. It said, clip it right here. Mm -hmm. And had I known that before, I would have used it. <laughs> um, and I also, we viewed a documentary together. So you got to watch with other people, which I think is like the future. <laughs> um, and the second thing more important is thanks to Pete, I connected with Wendy and that was the best part of my day. <laughs> And Wendy, after I read, after I read your page, I can't believe the overlap of connections. I mean, you recognized it, but wow, when I saw it, it's like every sentence. Um, so, and I'm going to just ask that when you get a chance, because you came on late, I would love for you to listen to what Mark and Jerry had to say at about the 1130 more, so we can continue that conversation. Um, it's also this call is also recorded, so we can clip that or, or come back to it and, and and replay or watch it offline. That would be great. Oh, that would be great because yeah. I'm sure there might be other people that want to continue. I have to be honest, Mark. The first, your first comment, I didn't even. I really didn't understand what you're talking. I really didn't get it. It was too up there for me. Although once I heard "woo," I was like, "All right, there's something here." But <laughs> but after Jerry asked you to elaborate. I know that I was right there because I actually thought of Nora Bateson before you said her. So I was like, okay, I got this. I want to keep talking. And Jerry, what you said also fits, believe it or not. <laughs> um, and it borders on what um, Wendy and I were, well, what I was trying to articulate. And anyway, that's it. I'm happy. <laughs> I love that. Stacey, thank you so much. Um, let's go Wendy, Hank, Shimon, Allison. Um, yeah, I, I feel like I have a ton to share, but trying to connect it to the conversation. Um, first, I was away last week, so I got a chance to just kind of take a step back and uh, think about all that I'd learned in the last six months, doing a lot of listening and curating and meeting people and figuring out kind of what next steps I want to take. So first, before I go any further, I just want to say hi. This is my first OGM call. Um, even though I've met quite a few of you and had many side conversations, I hadn't been able to actually come to OGM. My entrance into meeting most of you has been through originally through Kiko Lab. And so I'm, I'm glad to finally <laughs> make space for, for OGM. Um, and in all those conversations, the my background's similar to Stacy in that we um, I come from the world of psychology. So my interest uh, came from an original question of why aren't we already already why aren't all of us already thriving? Knowing that we have a lot of the answers we need and a lot of the technological technological capabilities, why aren't we using that for the betterment of creating human flourishing? and all these issues about consumerism and advertising and profitability and all that stuff, of course, are interwoven in why our societies and systems are the way they are. So fast forward, we're, I think you know everyone on this call and everyone that I've been meeting, we're all, the vision is quite similar. The question is, how do we start collaborating on all these pieces we know need to be in play and do it in a way that they can sync up with each other so that it can all rise together. Because I think as we're all individually learning, if we haven't articulated it fully yet or not, is each piece doesn't exist outside of the system. That's 
the problem, right? So if we develop a new economic system that doesn't really work outside of a new government system, governance and social order and, you know, a lot of other things and people wanting to work collaboratively together, I mean, all of this has to go together. So here's where my piece comes in. For me, I see things visually and I see the advantage of creating um, a visual interface that sits on top of a knowledge network to make it easier for people to navigate their way to the information they need that orients and creates knowledge sets in a way that um, makes sense to people and can ultimately end up being collaborative. Of course, that's the pinnacle. And then also eventually allowing people to kind of come into their own sense of, a, of wisdom, their own sense of intuitive decision-making that involves not only the knowledge that they've curated, the information, having access to full sets of information, but also where am I in my life? Where am I wanting to go? What do I want to do with it? How does that all go together for me personally? How do we create a platform like that? So I am to try to take steps there, I'm coming up with three initiatives for myself. One is the clam bake project, which maybe some of you have heard some about with Michael and Vincent and Jonathan Sands in the mix. And I think a couple other people putting more effort into that because that's kind of been on the fringe for me and making that front and center so that I can start saying, okay, well, I can't build what I want to build, but if we start there and use it as a, a proof of concept for how we can get a mapping interface to reduce friction for how people get into a site and through a site to the information that they want or need or is the most helpful, that would be one. So an interface that proves some sense of greater, less friction, greater navigability. Is that a word? That sounded good. Navigability then, nice. Two. <laughs> would be working on something that has a proof of concept for scalability, whether it's a free Jerry's brain kind of thing, right? You have so many nodes and connections already. We're not talking about a small subset of data. We're talking about a huge amount of data. Can we take a visual, same goals, maybe has to be built on a different platform though, so that it can work with free Jerry's brain, or maybe it's something we can anyway, and start playing around with the design so that we know that it has scalability and can show many things on screen. And then three for me is working with a small subset of people, anybody who's interested, to start talking about what would the optimal design be just for, um, just for a design prototype, knowing that the technology may not yet exist to actually implement this design uh, for a host of reasons that I have learned about in the last six months, but to at least design it so that we can show other people while we're working on this or working on this, this is where we're actually headed in the end. And so those are for me, the three things, um, lots of other little things around the edges, but that's kind of where I've landed. Um, would love feedback. That's, that's really beautiful. I think it resonates for lots of us, lots and lots of us. Um, and I'm, I'm really eager to have like a bailing wire toothpicks and scotch tape kind of mock-up of what these systems might look like that help us do what you just described. I, I just it, storyboarded, I don't care, but, but um, you know, story forward turns into wireframes, turns into some sample code, turns into stuff you can use. And I, I would love to get us working on, on these things together. Gil, go ahead. Where, where, where can we do that right now? Right now? What, 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 what tool out of this whole tool set would enable us to just do that live right now ongoing? Well, we've sort of been doing that ongoing for two years now with slow results. So Pete has, trying, has been trying to reinvent the wiki as massive wiki using markdown files because when you use markdown files and put them on a public server like GitHub, you've separated the data from the thing that, that claims to be a, 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 you know, some kind of service like a wiki, except yeah, well, MathWiki wiki doesn't behave like a wiki quite yet, right. except it could do a whole lot of other things. We're trying to fund we, pieces we to do make a lot of things, work. but Wendy's talking about something that's visual. Um, yes. Now you could layer yeah, stuff maybe, on top. Maybe on mirror, top. Which, mirror yeah, which, so not, which does not sing to me, but so, you know, something that lets me have, you know, um, in my computer, post-its on a wall that I can move around and draw lines between and connect right. strings to right. and, and layer in. Do we so have that? Bill, I, I started to put together, like I started to do research on all the different things that already exist, right? Cool. Tools that already exist. And quickly ran, a, ran up against some fundamental limitations of each and every single one of them for yep. what I'm imagining, right? Yep. So it, it 
maps really well and looks really good, but you can't edit it or collaborate. Yep. It, you can edit it, but it can't scale and it can't do much of anything else. Can't import data or export data or do anything, right? Like each, there are pieces, but not all together, which is why I landed on, okay, maybe some proof of concepts. Let's get something started in a, in a range of things that might already be useful to people like Free Jerry's Brain or let's just, uh, start with troll. Let's, just start, let's just start with something that's good enough for the moment and right. then we iterate and flip platforms, but we need and to, to start that's getting it tangible. That's, that's the project clam bake. And then anyone else who wants to help me visual, you know, I have a very clear, this is a, what's been in my mind for 10 years, developing for 10 years that I have yet to fully put on paper with a UI UX person or a group of people for two weeks. I know now we could just bang it out because I know, I know what needs to be in that. And I know what doesn't need to be in that anymore. Right. And that would be for me, the the sandbox that to me is going to be my my play space for a while as we iterate on that um that to me is where there could be a lot of back and forth and but i think until i at least get my thoughts into the design it would be hard for me i i want to hmm, let me say this differently you need to externalize what's in your head i need to externalize. thank you i need to externalize what's in my head before i i yet again try to compare it to something that exists because what happens every time I do that is I lose a little bit of my vision every time I dive deep into what exists and I don't Bingo. any longer want to lose my vision. So I want to get that out and then let's hack it to pieces. I don't care about that, but I need to get my thing out first. Brief comment and I'll pass it to, to Craig. Um, when you click on a link on any average web page uh, in the web, web universe, um, you send uh, a request to a server that says, ooh, ooh, you need all these piece parts. And those piece parts can exist on servers all across the inner tubes. Your browser doesn't give a damn. And that server request says, hey, send everything over to Jerry's browser over here. Your browser then assembles them. And wherever it doesn't get a piece from one of the servers, it says, oops, image missing here, which doesn't happen that often anymore. This thing is working really, really well. But any one of the little nuggets can be just a markdown file or a hypertext file or whatever, living any place on anybody's server that's publicly available. When I click on a node in my brain, it goes into a proprietary little data store that's attached to the brain. I want to click on a node the same way a web page is created so that the nuggets live on servers all across the inner tubes and are rich with metadata and are living in a distributed, that the reason I keep harping on separating the data from the tools is that then we start to be able to play and explore and riff and customize because I happen to like some weird things about the brain that other people are like, ah, I don't see why you like that, but I want this other thing. And Wendy, you could have your version of all singing, all dancing, and it could cooperate with my version of all singing, all dancing. If A, we can separate the data from the apps and B, we can create kind of a sandbox where the apps can play together. Because I'm really interested in that shared space where you're using the tool that you love most that helps you represent in you know information and insights, not not just like not just like a directory of of who's doing good work in the world. That's interesting, but but what are the insights and what what did this particular entity entity actually think they were going to do? What went wrong? What went right? What what you know what are the lessons learned and what have they achieved? And how do we how do we then copy that repo and then improve on it and then feedback give them a pull request for hey we saw what you did that was awesome and we've improved on it. What do you think? that process socially multiplied a million fold gets us somewhere really interesting. I can agree does, more. Does that make sense? Um, Craig, over to you in the booth. In the very distant booth where it's really late, like it's midnight now. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, no, it's 11 now. So I was, uh, I was an oh, hour I thought it was 11 when we started, started. sorry. It, it's 11 now, yeah. Um, whiteboards, I, I, I can't speak knowledgeably or, or even very intelligibly intelligently about good night my wife's going to bed <laughs> uh, about <laughs> in this conversation but I am aware that I have seen in uh, um, collaborative whiteboards as web pages in browsers with several users doing but I think it's I think they're text based and they're just sending requests. Uh, posting stuff up to uh, a web server and the, <clears throat> the page is rendering them there and that can be saved. But having done some work with WebRTC, I'm aware 
that there are uh, interactive whiteboards which are purely graphical, where people are sharing a whiteboard peer to peer over over WebRTC connections. Um, I'm aware that that exists. I'm no expert on them, but I know that that exists. And of course, the results of the uh, the interactions can be saved. Um, otherwise, I, I keep thinking that surely this requires that we figure out how to get data out of all these places where it, all these repos where it where it lives. Um, we need to get into Jerry's brain or the brain app, right? And export everything in JSON objects or something and collect them somewhere in some central API. That we've and we kind need of, to do that for, for we, every place that hold, is holding valuable data. Yeah. We have an export of my brain into a bucket of JSON objects, but we haven't really sucked it into Factor. Mark is playing with it, trying to bring it into MX. Pete wants to import it into All Massive, right, yeah. but needs some time and budget to do so. Like we're, we're actually sort of stuck on the sandbar of trying to, to do that because I'd like to use my brain data as a sourdough starter uh, mm. for this larger fungus to totally mix metaphors. Although fungus and starter is like pretty close. Um, but but we're, so interestingly, this conversation today, this last hour has described kind of our, our fun struggle for the last 18 months uh, to mm. try to figure out what this is, how it works and to prototype it. And we're not... We're not at that stage yet, and I'm dying to get to that stage. I want to play yeah, with these tools. Yeah. I really want to shift into a new set of tools that lets us play together. <clears throat> Just it's like it's like you've got you've got like like a, a teeter totter, and and I've got sort of a working swing, and someone else has got a sand a sandbox, and they're not in the same neighborhood, and we can't actually play together. So yeah, um, I, yeah. John yeah. has to John has to boogie shortly. I'd love for him to check in before I go back to the normal queue. So John, if you'd like to to step in. Okay, thank you. Yes, so I am in Maine at a, as part of a family reunion, and this picture, I probably blocking my, that's me, and my brother and sister-in-law, and Mr. whatever he is, sun, Sunspot or what, this is the Arcadia Solar Farm. An interesting thing about this is, you know, it's, this is Maine, we're halfway up the coast, it's not, not what you'd think of as ideal solar territory, and in fact, my brother's house, not a good house to install solar uh, panels on, but this is a, this is a B Corp. This is a, you can buy a share. You buy a share and uh, you get, you know, I mean, I think my brother bought 500 kilowatts hours per year for 20, for 15 or 20 years. And um, then you get it, you know, and, but now it has to come through the grid. So you have to have either a cooperative utility or a utility that has been persuaded that it, it had better be cooperative or it's gonna be in more, more trouble. But the thing works and you know the, the, the objections about land use, I mean, they're real, but this one is over a brownfield. You know, there's, there's a lot of, there's toxic waste dumps. There's a lot of places where you could put these things. Hey, and, great new uh, use for Superfund sites. Also, Right, and it's also more efficient. I mean, the thing gets covered with snow, you know, but so when it's covered with snow, efficiency goes down to zero, but the net efficiency over time is predicted, calculated to be 85% because the snow doesn't stay on these things, at the angle they're at. And if you have to do maintenance on them, the fact that they're all in one place, a lot easier. The, the co-op can, you know, budget to have somebody get the snow off and they're actually going to have uh, sheep um, eating the uh, <laughs> the uh, invasive plants that are underneath this thing that are uh, you know that would have a tendency to grow and, and and block the solar so a lot of interesting ideas not not you know super breakthrough technology but but a way around a couple of bottlenecks that we have already all referred to in the uh, in the talks so that's my check-in. I really like the conversation about finding the tools. I agree with what a lot of you are saying. It's a great conversation. I really look forward to a, a graphic tool. I mean, the kind of things you're all talking about, Gil, and everybody's talking about these kind of things. And uh, yeah, just something that, that works and gets us started uh, will be great. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait. But 
I do have to go because we're leaving uh, where we are now and heading south for the next meeting. So thanks, good John. To see you all. Happy trails. Enjoy your travels and your family. That okay. sounds that sounds like a lot of fun. All right. Um, is there a thread for that subject in the uh, Mattermost? Which subject? The uh, uh, the tool, the uh, the magic tool we're, ta we're all talking well, about. Well, uh, sorry. So yes, there's several different threads. There's maps and mapping. There's build OGM, uh, which is more about the whole ecosystem. Um, and I'm, I'm forgetting a couple. Uh, but if not, if there isn't one that's well enough focused on on this, let's go start a new one. But um, if someone wants to, wants to scan through the, the Mattermost channels that you're on and see which ones are most appropriate, that'd be great. Yeah, just like to be kept uh, or to be able to stay uh, abreast of developments because that, that's an area that uh, interests me and I may be able to make a contribution at some point. Awesome, especially yes. now that you're off of Windows servers. So I'm happy to be in the conversation, yeah. I was um, just, I think maps and mapping is a good spot. Maps and okay. mapping, yeah, yeah. I'll check in there then. That's yeah. the channel that I, that I think I would naturally go to for this. Thanks. Cheers. Um, let's go Hank, Shimon, Allison. Hank, nice to see you. Hey, it's nice to see you too, Jerry. Nice to see everybody else. Um, it's been a while. Things have been pretty pretty busy over here at, I mean, personally and well, specifically at work. Um, you know, Q4 is just busy for us, but it was nice to, uh, it was nice to like see this chunk of time free on my calendar and know that I could just kind of jump and actually like put my toe back into the stream here. Um, Cause it's always fun. And I mean, I, I, I think I'm always amazed that um, a lot of the things that I think about are mirrored in the comments that you guys are making, um, which is just, I don't know, it's just kind of cool, right, to like jump in and hear all that stuff. So um, on that note, I, I'm going to have to leave soon. So I'm going to do one of those check-ins where like I say a couple of things, respond to a couple of things, and then can't participate in the conversation that <laughs> happens after. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. But um, on the note, on the notion of like tools um, before, I think it's, you know, it's something that we've talked about specifically in this group really since like day one almost, right? It's like, um, you know, how do we design a system or a tool or suite of tools that kind of help us collectively express and explore um, and, you know, mine this or harvest this, this wonderful garden of thoughts that we, that we cultivate. Um, and I think that one of the things that I've run into in both my conversations and attempts to put it into practice is that, I, I, I don't know if this is the right way to characterize it, but there seems to be almost like this, every time you create something new in order to really get good at using it, there has to be some level of expertise that goes into using the tool that only a few people get to, right? Which immediately creates one of those walls where it's kind of like, okay, we start with this vision of, of creating this place where like theoretically everybody can come in and, and just start to play. Um, and then we then like create almost this third party that then this person has to interact with, which creates another communication barrier, which is just kind of like restarts the conversation over, right? Um, and that isn't to highlight or to harp on the futility of such a of such an action or such a desire or, or, or project. Um, it's really just to kind of, I guess, reflect out loud, like that's kind of some of the stuff that I'm seeing. Um, obviously, I think it's something that we're all, we're all just kind of trying to solve for here in, in ways, but, um, it's still interesting to kind of try to hold those two ideas in balance, right? Like how do you create the system, but also create it in a way that like allows these, for lack of a better term, right? Third parties to exist, but exist in a way that still integrates with the way that other people talk and communicate, um, which is, uh, I guess a problem we'll, we'll have for a little while. Um, I think the second thing is that I was, I too was thinking about this idea of um, consumerism and social media and et cetera, right? And like reached some of the same, I don't want to say conclusions or insights, but for right now we will, um, that were reflected here. And then I had to kind of turn around and like ask, and I'm just kind of at the beginning of this thought. So um, I'll go back and look at the recording to see if you guys uh, <laughs> take any of these farther or further. Um, it's like, 
I'm like, okay, is consumerism bad or is it convincing people that they have to consume certain things to enhance their lives bad, right? Like is social media bad or is social, is the fact that social media has been used in a way that like um, incentivizes us or highlights this, those negative aspects of our human nature bad, right? Um, and I, I know those are kind of more like, I don't maybe philosophical questions. I don't even know, but um, you know, in how is that reframing the problem? Is that are we still talking about the same the same thing there when we ask the question a little bit differently? Um, I, I don't really know, uh, but it's something that again that I had just that I had just been thinking about um, before this. So it was really just to kind of highlight, like, hey. It was cool to jump into the conversation and hear other people basically say the same thing. So anyway, that's my check-in. Um, it's great to see you guys again. And Wendy, nice to, nice to see you. Thanks, Hank. And I just, um, I just see this as like the movie Ron or Rashomon. It's like uh, there are many of us here. Each of us has our tail and our background, and we're trying to work through the same information. Mm. And maybe if we're lucky, we meet in the middle. And if we're yeah. really unlucky, we get like, he was a thief. He's the hero. Oops. <laughs> um, and that's that's kind of happening in the public sphere, right? Like we're getting we're getting sort of intentionally divergent stories about the same evidence that we're looking at, or ignoring evidence that we're looking. Whatever uh, th th what you pointed to is like really important. Hank, um, Wendy. Oh yeah. So just to react to to Hank, um, right? It's one of those like don't throw the baby out with the bathwater thing. You know, I think we've, we've learned a lot and I think there's so much to say and from a perspective of um, social psychology and, and, and human thinking and uh, human habits. And to me, it's the original goal of Facebook, the original goal of the internet, the original goal of a lot of these are people coming together going, let's do something great. Let's do something better than what we have. To me, where it go, starts to go right is in the how we get there. Right. And, and so many of our systems are set up to reward the things that we don't want. So when that's taken to the extreme, then we end up with a whole array of influences that we don't want on society. So taking Facebook as an example, right? The idea of connecting people is fabulous. I have used it for that. I've connected with people I never thought of. I mean, it's had a lot of benefit in my life. However, all the algorithms have been written to make a profit off of advertising. And they have gotten extremely good at reducing friction for engagement. You put those two things together and you're now literally to someone's point from earlier, I think it was Craig's, we, we, we are now patterning our behavior based on one outcome alone. That becomes the problem, right? And so the how we got there took us on a, on a bent, on a path that wasn't healthy for anyone and now is run amok. So how, to me, that how becomes an essential component of whatever we build next. Love that. Thank you. Um, let's go Shimon, Allison, Tony, Gil, Michael. Yeah, it's been a very fascinating conversation for me. Uh, I don't want to sort of like touch on everything that resonated with me, just a few of the things that I'm working on. Uh, to Wendy, it's nice to meet you. I'm actually a psychiatrist, so it seems like we have a psychological kind of uh, subgroup here. And I totally agree with a lot of the observations, especially the idea of uh, flourishing and thriving and uh, as a population. What drives my work is exactly that, and it's tied to going back to first principles, which are essentially how do we create within ourselves as a society, a, a framework that allows us to achieve what the founders, the Declaration of Independence is all about, which is the role of government is essentially the happiness of the people. So whether it's a matter of uh, Thatcher or, you know, like uh, Reagan, you know, blaming government, how is it that we reintroduce that idea that should be our kind of North Star. And that's what I'm working on. Now, in order to achieve that, you have a number of things that you have to take into account. I think that what's missing in these conversations is an overriding paradigm that really allows us to think at those terms. I've been working with a paradigm called salutogenesis, which essentially is the creation of health. How do we think about 
the challenges that we have, not as pathology. So for example, Facebook, how do we think about Facebook from the point of view, perhaps like Wendy was saying, starting out about connecting people rather than the pathology that's associated with it. So in that regard, by the way, I came across a book that just got published the last month, System Error, Where Big Tech Went Wrong and How We Can Reboot. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but the interesting thing about this book is that it was written by three Stanford professors who teach probably more computer science students that will eventually create these algorithms than anybody else. So the thing that they put forth, essentially one is a philosopher, one is a computer scientist, and one is a political science person. So what they put forth ideas about how to reclaim, you know, digital technology in terms of the public good. What struck me and what I really like about this book is they start out talking about Aaron Schwartz. I don't know how many of you know Aaron Schwartz, but essentially Aaron Schwartz was all about how to make digital technology better. He was one of the founders of Reddit, you know, like collective commons and things of that kind. So the first part of the book actually is devoted to him, contrasting him with those people that decide that their kind of life mission is going to be to create apps to beat parking tickets. So the question is, and Aaron Schwartz actually has, in my mind, the formula of how to move forward, how to sort of like work collaboratively collaboratively, technology people, philosophers, expert domain, domain experts, and user interface people and things of that kind. So I've been actually trying to merge Aaron Schwartz's kind of conceptualization of the role of technology. Uh, obviously he's just one of many uh, that you don't hear about as much, plus salutogenesis, which is the concept that essentially talks about what creates well-being and flourishing. And according to that understanding, flourishing and well-being is actually caused by people's sense of coherence. And if any of you had looked at the New York Times article about liberals versus conservatives, whether they are happier or not, essentially it's all about coherence. It's about how to make sense of the world. And that's not the only part. The other part is not just making meaning, but feeling that you're able to act on whatever sense of meaning that you have. And to the point I think that was raised during kind of the chat, you know, in terms of economic trauma and other traumas, the problem is in my mind that so many people feel marginalized, alienated, and not able to act on their essentially destroyed coherent worldview which leads to anger associating with, you know, people that are authoritarian. I mean, I can get into a discussion if anyone wants offline. So the question is how to provide tools to allow people to have more meaning in their lives. And part of it is giving them tools that they can engage locally in their communities. That's why one of my projects is the opiate epidemic because so much of the complexity of it is on a local level. People feel very marginalized. The question is like right now we're 22 years into it supposedly, and yet there were community meetings in 1999 in West Virginia, but yet they were not able to change the system. So where is the power within the system? And for that, you need complexity theory. So my approach, and again, I find you know, that at some point collaboration is important, but laying out a framework and a structure is very, very important. So I've actually shared a couple of links. Obviously I have a lot more. If anyone is interested in offline, you know, learning more about it, I'd be certainly happy to talk about it, but clearly having a paradigm that drives the tools that drives a conversation that allows us to span time is really important. And for me, the time frame is 2026, which is when we're celebrating the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. So how is it that by then we can go back to first principles? 
Um, Shimon, thank you. That's a really rich. Uh, uh, that's a really rich set of ideas you put on the table. I just want to uh, draw out something you said a moment ago because <clears throat> I have saluted Genesis in my brain, and when you said coherence, uh, I went to coherence. And for example, just as an example, um, under coherence, I found and remembered because I didn't remember having put this in my brain. Coordinated management of meaning (CMM), which comes from Vernon Cronin, uh, Arnett Pierce, and is about collaborative sense making and meaning making. It's a framework, <clears throat> right? Salutogenesis, I think of as a goal, not a framework. So I don't know, I'm really interested in what you mean by using, for example, if we said, let's use salutogenesis as a framework for our activities here. I don't, I can't actually imagine what that tumbles into. What does that create? Because uh, I know that it's about <clears throat> public health and you know prophylaxis and a bunch of other stuff that I don't know that I didn't put in here. And I know that the, the general healthcare system that we have <clears throat> is built around pathogenesis. Basically, how do we stop disease, right? It's the opposite. And I, and I love the ideas behind salutogenesis, um, which, which uh, connect up with subjective well-being and uh, <clears throat> a bunch of other stuff. Here's Aaron Antonovsky, who sort of uh, helped pioneer that stuff. I don't know how to use it as a, other than as a motivational framework. I don't know how to use it as a structural framework for what we're doing here. And Allison has an answer to that, which is why it's so awesome that you're next in the queue even. It is awesome that I'm next in the queue. I'm really excited about being awesome <laughs> next in the queue. And I can't say I entirely have a framework, but we do align Shimon and I on this salutogenesis approach. And what I have been um, putting forward and just as a background, because I haven't had a chance to meet Wendy who just jumped out of the call anyway. Um, my, my, my jam is uh, monetary design, right? So that, that and, and designing economic ecosystems. Um, the first part of that that I visualize is healing economic trauma and the importance of seeing a lot of what it is that we're talking about as symptomology of economic trauma, because the way that we design our relational, right, it's what relations, economics is about relationships fundamentally, is it not, right? That is what it's about. It's about connecting with other people to collectively fulfill our, our desires. So when we have an economy that prioritizes extraction instead of relationships, as an indigenous economy might have done with the wampum belt, for instance, then we're going to have a series of traumas that repeat over and over again with behaviors that are all coming from this basic place of operating in contradiction to one another's well-being and not in contradiction to the fundamental joy of the relationship. That's economic trauma. We can see it in absolutely everything. Why are we talking about social media constantly reinforcing these negative behaviors when we talk about advertising? And what's the role of advertising? To siphon more money in that everybody is competing for. So bringing in the monetary design is an aspect of why social media, as great as it could be, turns out to be a negative impact. I think it's worth talking about. I think it's interesting to look at, too, the second piece that fascinates me is designing economic ecosystems. And the third piece is drawing down all the crap that we have in the, in the air. So salutogenic monetary design is something worth looking at. Our, okay, so the three components of salutogenesis, somebody feels right with a relationship with their life in the world, when they have a sense of meaning, right? When we have our sense of um, uh, ability, or we're well resourced, we can ask for the help that we need and we can get what we want. We have a sense of coherent, like um, so predictability, right? Shimon, you wanna correct me, I'm a little bit underslept. So those three things are indicative of our money design. Okay, so money is created as, really it's talked about as two major things. A unit of account will just say whatever that's, uh, but it's really, it's a medium of exchange and a store of value. A medium of exchange allows money to be able to make us feel resourced, okay? That's part of salutogenesis. A store of value allows us to feel that in the future we have some sense of predictability. Okay? So those two fundamental pieces of salutogenesis, right, are inherent within our economic and monetary design. However, 
meeting needs right now and storing value or having some predictability in the future. <laughs> Those two very different um, needs are currently being met with the same fully flawed money, right? That is causing problems. We've got to recognize that. We cannot store money and use it as a medium of exchange without wreaking havoc in so many different ways. So we need to untether those, address that those are two fundamental human needs and design an economy to be able to meet those needs. The final thing is meaning. And meaning, um, we, we tend to think that the economy is neutral. I tried to explain this in the last piece that I wrote about Voldemort money, right? So because it is so um, <clears throat> devoid of meaning, we tend to think of our money as being neutral, right? So I get a lot of feedback from people who care a lot about the climate. And I say, well, the money, we've got to address this. We can't just get on the phone and tell people to use money in a responsible way. And they say, no, Allison, I think it's about how we choose to use our money. Money isn't the problem, it's how we choose to use it. We'll see them, we're blinded again, okay? Because we're choosing to think that just because money is meaningless, that it's neutral. And that's, a, that's, that's flawed perception. So right now, this crypto world is creating meaningless money just to grow. But there are also people who are trying to reflect meaning with their money, right? Having the money reflect just like time banking and community currencies have done, reflecting something that's meaningful, a gift that somebody is bringing into the world something that can be evaluated, something that's regenerating. So this is where we are at right now, is at this forefront of designing money that has meaning, designing money that can just be used as a medium of exchange, and designing money that can, or designing whatever it is that creates some kind of equity stake in the future so that we feel some sense of security going forward, right? So that's it, that's salutogenic monetary design. I think it's worth talking about. <laughs> dang, dang. It's completely worth talking about. And um, money is one of those tar pit kind of, kind of issues for me in that very few people even actually can explain well what money is. And it has all these little sinkholes where, where dinosaurs were buried and fossilized. Like, why does the Federal Reserve exist and how does that happen? Or how does money actually get created and who gets to create it? Or isn't Bitcoin going to fix this? Or like, like I, I could just sort of, without thinking too hard, I can think of like lots of different like pits of, of where we're getting stuck trying to rethink money and, its, and our relationship to it. And, and one of my big bug, one of the reasons I love the great transformation, Carl Polanyi's book from 1944, is that one of the things he says is that before the Industrial Revolution, everything didn't have a price. Before the Industrial Revolution, we, we stayed alive really nicely uh, through reciprocity, redistribution, and householding are the three things he points to, and then a bunch of other stuff. And we can't, we have a hard time imagining today, unless you've lived on a kibbutz or done something progressive, um, we can't imagine today a world where everything doesn't have a price and you don't have to have money to buy your sustenance for the day. We can't, we can't actually even picture that. And so Replacing money with better money is interesting, but what if we could live happily without money? What if there were other forms of, of cooperation, collaboration, Allison? Yes, and. Yeah. There so this is, is a rich, it's a motherload of. Yeah. Right? How do we incentivize getting people onto the collective and things like that? And kind of what some one of the shares, um, I tried to share this, this beautiful book that was just published for COP26 on climate adaptation about community living and multiple other chapters about currency and how many, how much fewer resources. And it, um, and so, yeah, definitely that's, that's one of the major ways. And right now I'm excited to say, so a personal update that I've reached out to local, um, indigenous groups who are going to help me to under, to, come up with a model of putting my teeny tiny piece of land that I have inherited through by virtue of being white and having, and having family who could afford two acres of land in Sonoma County and putting that into a land trust with um, under the advisement of the local indigenous community who, 
who will either own part of it, be able to access and advise the land management and what, whatever. So um, anyway, land trust and community living are definitely a way forward. I love land trusts. I think they're awesome. The, the whole idea that we've turned our houses into our retirement accounts and that we want appreciation of those houses. So we basically want to price people who can't afford houses right out of neighborhoods. Like that whole, that whole dynamic sucks. Like oh, I, I, I hate that that's what we now expect and that everybody's sad when their neighborhood doesn't appreciate a lot every year. It's like, man, do, do, do we realize the implications of of turning our homes into investment vehicles. And, and this is economic trauma. When we're so frozen about trying to create security for ourselves that we can't detach from that. Totally. And, and create new systems that alleviate, that actually replicate maybe carbon cycles instead of holding on to money that lasts forever. Yeah. Michael, please jump in. No, you're muted. Yeah, I was I was going to say something about um, you know pending pending the utter redesign of of the economic system um, regarding that that house appreci home appreciation and how it impacts gentrification and all that smart contracts I'm I'm really interested in this idea and exploring to see if anybody's playing with it. Uh, the idea that smart contracts could be a way for um, for the over real estate turning over in an area to benefit the people who are there the longest or at worst being displaced so that there's you know that that just the way that nfts can be sold and benefit the artist um, the person who lived in the house and took care of it when the economic value of that area was not as high could somehow benefit from the, the you know, further valuation of that, of that space. Um, I think there's something there. Yeah, thanks, Michael. There. Thanks for saying that. I have... I do actually, I'm, I'm needed in a different Zoom. I don't know about needed. I have to show up in a different Zoom um, and we are missing to my knowledge, these people who didn't have a chance to check in. I'm happy to pass the con. Actually, I don't even have to pass the con because we're not in my Zoom or in uh, Collective Next Zoom. So if, uh, if you want to, to stay here and, and go through the rest of the queue, that'd be fine. I don't know who would like to step forward or we can wrap the call uh, right now with my apologies to the people who didn't have a chance to check in. Preferences? Tony? Yeah, you're waving goodbye. You're muted. Tony's waving goodbye, saying no, don't need to check in right now. He's uh, he's good. So why don't we why don't we wrap this call? Um, that sounds great. Uh, Shimon and I, I think, will plan. Uh, uh, he just uh, DM'd me a little bit here on the side uh, and said he can do a presentation about cellular genesis. I'm thinking we could do a pop up call on cellular genesis. Allison, I'll coordinate with you so that you and Shimon kind of are, are, are we, so that we make sure that both of you can make the call. And we'll just uh, set something up. Groovy. I'm going to stick something. I was taking some notes since I didn't really check in uh, about um, the idea of information consumption um, as disease, and uh, and you know what the diagnosis might be. So you want to put that in the Mattermost I'll chat, the, Mattermost. The, the calls yeah. channel for Mattermost, which is this channel which we were supposed to be using instead of the Zoom here, but that failed. Yeah, yeah. Um, that'd be great. Sure. Super. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate your being here and you're sharing your hearts and souls and ideas. Oh. Good to see you.